Shell contract B, Friday, 1500 to 1550. Insert security competition here with Wasabi. Wasabi is a security researcher who dabbles in the arts of security system administration. He participated in CCDC, CPTC, and many CTFs as a competitor before starting to help organize cyber defense competitions himself. He's now the black team lead for WRCCDC. All right, well, hello, everyone. Um, let's get started here. We're gonna insert a security competition here. Um, so n the plan was to have my co-lead for WRCCDC Blue Screen um, be here today. Um, unfortunately, he got SANS training and um, he's enjoying that instead of being here and presenting with me. So I, I am, my nickname is Spicy Wasabi. I run WRC CDC Black Team. That means I put together the scenarios, the content, um, put together the team that builds the, the, um, the challenges and the stuff that the team see. I also help uh, put together um, CPTC. So I do quite a few competitions. Um, there's quite a bit um, that I've seen with how competitions are generally organized. So today this is a talk to give back and give people a general idea of what it takes to build a competition. So again, um, there's a little background, but uh, you'll see uh, he's, a little, he's crossed off um, because he's enjoying a SANS training. But let's get started. Uh, to begin, you generally need an idea of what type of competition we're going to be focusing on. While I have in here planned to talk about all different types of competitions from CTFs, to um, blue team defensive competitions to red team um, attack competitions. The one that we're going to be focusing on most um, right now is going to be WRCCDC. The reason for this is because we've recently undergone quite a few organizational changes and we've also gone through putting together quite a few tools to automate and make our lives easier and help build a structure um, that works for making competitions scalable. Um, so, a bit about WRCCDC. It's been in existence since 2008. It is a competition that is all defensive. You, um, as a college student, can participate and you go in and you compete against other blue teams and also you have a professional red team made up of industry, um, uh, either sponsors or just people who want to be involved, who attack you and try to take down your sites. So you're basically running a business. So that, that's cool, and that's what we're going to be focusing on, is to simulate a realistic environment that teams have to deal with, and they do deal with it. Um, the teams sometimes spend the entire year building a strategy. Our goal is to provide them with something different every year. So that's quite a bit of a challenge. If you're going to build a business every year that has to have a CEO, it has to have, you know, a, you know, tech people. It has to have an. It has to have the t um, IT team that was eventually. We usually the scenario says they're fired, but we have to build all these things and all the background information, and make it into something that's usable and simulate something that's realistic. It can. It's very easy to build things that are very broken, but it doesn't help teams learn what they're doing and it doesn't help them build new skills. So last year, or I should say two years ago now. Um, the WRCCDC organization lost its leads. Um, it went through quite a bit of environment changes, including total loss of all the infrastructure, twice, um, which meant that all the systems that we'd used, the build systems, the tools, the previous years of virtual machines and competition material, all gone. So what do you do when that happens and you still have a competition to put together? Well, you build things really quickly and you try to figure out what people are going to like. But you're not always going to win on that. It's very hard to find out what people want because they will tell you and it's, it doesn't necessarily that it's, you know, they want a fun competition. But in reality what they want is something that makes sense. And so we had to, you know, just put things together. And, the first thought we had was, let's just put this competition together. It's easy, you know, how hard can it be to build a bunch of Windows VMs, make them vulnerable, make them, you know, have, you know, a domain, have some users, and just let people have fun, you know, that'll be easy. And it's easy when you only have a few challenges. It, it's easy when you have 
a few competitors. But when you start scaling to where you have 300, 400 VMs per team, then things start getting a little challenging because now you're running a whole network. Now you're running an environment that everyone has to deal with and you have to have a lot of coordination. For example, for CCDC and CPTC, each team gets a entire what we call pod, which is a enclosed network identical to the next team, but has the functioning basics of a business. And to build that, you have to have the tooling in place to be able to build that pod itself, but also network it and get it running where the teams can log in and score off of it in whatever fashion that's going to be. And when building a larger competition such as this, it's not just a one-off with CTFs because there's actual costs that are associated with building a competition. When you build a CTF and you want to run it for, let's say, Shellcon, you need a few dozen VMs. You need, so that either can be something you spin up in AWS, DigitalOcean. It, it's not very expensive. It's not very costly. Um, there's still a cost, but when you start scaling to have those huge numbers of VMs, those huge number of concurrent users, all trying to use different services that are identical, you have to factor in that that's going to be something that you can't do alone, and you're going to need a team. So, a little bit of danger. Um, competitions are serious business, and not for just the organizers. Um, if you're a competitor, competitions are, in some cases, your life. Um, we've learned this one somewhat the hard way. Um, Competitors are really serious about this, and it's not fair to them, especially when they've put in so much time. With CTFs, if someone doesn't like a CTF, you say, okay, I'm going to be done. I'm, I'll just find another one. With these types of competitions, the teams usually have an elimination process. It's like divisions, and they're working through their school to be, um, get to be on their team to just compete, and if the content that you're giving does not deliver to something that they expect, they won't play again, and they don't, you've lost that learning environment. So um, it takes a lot of time, and also the one thing we've also discovered is everyone's happy to take on leading roles in, in a volunteering event until they realize how much time it takes, and they won't tell you. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up is people are unreliable. If you are an organizer, just remember this, because they will not be there for you when they say they will. Um, it's not that you have to take things on yourself, but if you find that person in a volunteering organization that says, hey, I'm going to do this, and they stick to it, and they do it, and you know they're up helping you when it's 2, 3 in the morning, that's someone you have to find out what they need. Um, just like you have to find out the needs for the competitors, you have to find out what your dedicated volunteers need, um, whether that's just support or it's, you know, going out and getting you know, a few beers after the event, or anything. You have to find out what they need and what they want, because you won't get that again. You will find dozens of people saying they're willing to commit, and then you won't get anything back. So the goal here is to just be aware. People are very unreliable. I think I've said it like 20 times. But just remember that when you're building a competition and you say you need 30 people, because of those 30 people, maybe 10 will be there. So. Um, this is another question that people don't often ask themselves, and I put this in there, it's just very quick, but what does a competition mean to you? What does it mean to the, uh, you know, another person? Go ask, because some people say the competition is just for fun. It's going to be just a learning environment, I'm just here to ha play around, and when it's done, I'm, it's done. But some people, they depend on these competitions for jobs, they depend on them for getting technical skill, these are almost like um, classes for certain people, so it means a lot of different things, and the only thing that I found in common is the hands-on experience. Um, so if you're trying to find out what does a competition mean and the general polling results, it's going to be the third one down. But for everyone else, you may need to find out what your competition needs to do. So um, for us, CCDC is generally sp uh, special. We're volunteers, but we're also people who participated in CCDC. I think of the team that I have this year, only two have never participated in CCDC. All the rest are volunteers who have participated in some way, whether that was being on um, our traffic generation side, where they pretend to be users working with the competition teams, or they are, were actually on the teams. So it's special because we've all participated and we've all had that experience. It's all unique for each of us. So in, in the bottom is an example topology from a couple of years ago. 
and you can see how detailed there are things in the competition. I know it's really small, um, but this was a sim simulated um, AV company, so they had a virus repo, and if you got all your viruses escaped by Red Team, they would use those to attack you, and then you'd have loss of malware and confidential information. So that's the type of things we do. So one of the things we, um, we looked into when we started taking over the event was people have views of what they want from a competition, whether it's being an organizer, when it, whether it's being a competitor. We had to ask these questions to ourselves, and we had to say, what do competitors truly value, and what do we value? And we found that we need to focus more on what the competitors value, what they find important, than what the, com the organizers say. Because even though it's not as much fun, if you have no one to play in your competition, there's no point in it existing. Um, this is the same for CTFs. Um, you have, if you build a CTF that's amazing and nobody can solve any of the challenges, you're not going to get anyone to play again. Um, and a good example of this is you have um, uh, like Plaid CTF versus, um, um, I'm blanking on the name, but uh, let's do, um, man, I just escaped me. Um, Pico CTF, there we go. One's designed for beginners and one's designed for basically being a DEF CON qualifier. If you put the people who are doing the beginner competition in the advanced one, and you'd be like, you're probably right asking, why would you ever do that? But those people who were learning how to play CTFs would never play a CTF again. Just like if you played and those advanced teams in the advanced competition played the beginner one and they solved it all, they would find it boring and not want to play. So your goal is to find a medium balance between those two sides of what the competitors are playing and do that as best as you can. So our goal was how do we keep our new jobs? How do we continue to be organizers without getting fired in the sense that nobody wants to play our competition? Um, one of the things that we found for us was it's easy to start focusing on business in a competition like uh, where you have policy work. In CCDC and CPTC, there's a lot of policy work compared to a regular CTF. And what was happening was the competition was moving into a direction where it was more business competition than a defense and cyber competition. And teams did not like that, but they didn't tell us. So we kept doing what we were doing, and until we polled and we evaluated and we asked, um, what we actually ended up doing was we ran a series of trial competitions before the real ones and found out what people did. We said, here's this one. It's going to have a set of metrics. Um, one of them was very business heavy. One of them was no business at all. One of them had no scoring. You know, just you know, play. Let, let's find out what happens. And we found, in, after each one, we did a poll and found out what people liked. So with those, we were able to find out that people indeed did not like the, the way the competition was scored on how it was weighted. And so we changed it. Um, and we, the other thing that we really focused on was making sure their teams have cross communication. Because if, as volunteers, you focus on your own one area. If I'm building all the scenario content, I'm not talking to the people who are doing the business stuff, and they think their stuff is the coolest thing ever and they want to have more of it. And while I want more of my technical stuff, if we all want more of what we're building, it doesn't balance out. So communication is also very key. I know that's you know, a given for 99% of the things that exist, but having communication between your organizers is very important. And then, of course, just keep the customers happy. The customers are your competitors. I know we're going to a business quote here, but, let's, but you want to share with people and have fun doing it. So be silly. Um, I think, um, in general, CTFs that are themed have a lot of fun. Um, one of my favorites was one they made a Monopoly board, um, and everything was silly and themed like it was a, a game board, like you were playing on a game board and having your pieces move through. It was very well themed. It had everything integrated. Every part of the challenge was related. It looked, it themed, it was immersive. And looking back, I still remember that competition even though I played it you know, five years ago. So those are the types of things. Think about what will be memorable as well. Um, so here's our, um, our um, music station for the teams. Um, when we, were, we run the competition, we try to serenade the teams with the best um, music 10-hour remixes that we can find. So 
you know, you have to have fun, and you have to let your organizers have fun at some point. So that's how we do it. I don't know whether the teams actually like it, but we do. Um, and then the other important thing is keep modernizing. It's very easy to get stuck with doing the same types of things. How many people have said, I've seen, you know, SQLI, let's just keep doing that competition year after year. Or I've seen, you know, MS08. Well, if you see MS08 in a competition these days, there's probably a very specific reason for it, or they're just being lazy. How long ago did that exploit come out? Well, it's over 10 years now, so. Um, it's, it's a little long. It's not something that you're going to likely see. Sure, as a, as a pen tester, you're going to see that all the time still. But if you're trying to push their skills further and further, that's not something you should be focusing on. You should not still be putting eight Windows XP boxes or eight basic vulnerabilities. You should be tiering the levels. You should be saying, here's a basic one, and then here's a medium, medium one, and here's an advanced one. The more level you put into your work, the more the teams will build themselves up year after year, and then you have a competition that keeps growing. Um, we, as ourselves, CCDC, since it's an infrastructure competition in a sense, we have been pushing ourselves to go to the cloud. And that's kind of hard because the competition isn't designed for that. So we've been coming up with new ways to do that, but there's a lot of resistance in that as well. So one of the things that I personally take away from this is, as a competition organizer, the one thing you're going to always have taking a w leaving the co the event is not that you've learned um, is not that you've you know built new you know things you know you're not going to see people talking necessarily about what you've built, but you're going to learn. And if you treat the learning a aspect as a volunteer as something that you're going to get, it's something that you can put on your resume. It's something you can you know use forever from that point on. You know, for us, like how many people get a chance to deploy a new exchange domain and migrate that exchange domain to, you know, 0365? Well, most people don't get that opportunity. But in a competition, that's something you may do year after year because that's something that companies are doing. So you get this fast paced learning environment that normally people don't get into. So um, here's a list of the competitions. Um, I will point out. The goal, again, is to learn new things. And if your team gets, if you get bored, that's a problem. So if you look at this screenshot, we put cameras in the competition this year. And they're playing Halo, the original Halo. Um, and if you see the red on their scoring computer, it's all red except for one service. So they, they're completely failing. And um, yeah, it's not good. This is when you give, this is the, the best picture of giving up I can think of. And that brings me to the next point. Everyone has an idea of what a competition is supposed to be, as I said, but here's the problem. Everyone has the Mr. Robot idea of what a competition is supposed to be, what the industry is supposed to be. It's supposed to be cool, and you're supposed to be wearing a hoodie and going with a little fold-out keyboard into, and hacking into some you know, technology that's sitting right behind the wall, and somehow you can do it. The reality, though, is that nobody does that. At least not most people do that. You know, you'll see at DEF CON those people who get a chance to break into like power plants and things like that, and it's really cool. But that's not our industry. There's policy work. There's, you know, boring IT stuff. There's the, the really unfun things that exist. So while you do get to do those fun things, as a pen tester, for example, you get to go break into those websites and all those things. You get to be Mr. Robot a little bit. But afterward, you have to go and write that report that says what you did. So it's not, everyone expects it to be easy and fun. And TV does a very bad job, I'm pretty sure of every industry, but especially cybersecurity, information security, it does a very poor job of describing what we actually do. Um, I won't, you know, like NCIS is a pretty bad information security show. Um, but they don't, people don't know that. People expect that to be what people can do. And so, our goal is to make this cool and fun, um, but not make it boring and challenging to the point where people don't, don't see the fun in it and don't want to get into it. Because after all, a competition like what we're doing, where it's college students, anywhere from freshman to super, super senior, that is a thing. Um, you, can, you need to make it so that they have fun. So one of the things we did is teach them in a way that brings the, the TV to them, but not as much so that they don't learn the real skills. So in our case, 
One of the things that we did um, was um, built in ICS things where it was mock, it, was, it looked flashy, but in reality it was not um, really there. Because in, in this is what the reality is, is that everyone expects it to be the flashy stuff, but in reality you're still looking at the guy who has his password on a sticky note. And that's the type of security we're trying to defend against and build better posture around. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to it. But in general, the problem is that everyone still is running, you know, vulnerable things. They're still doing things that are the same problems year after year. So building those skills is important. So let's get started. Um, as competition organizers, um, everyone talks in their own bubble. Uh, this is something that I learned. Um, even within CCDC, no organization uh, that runs CCDC, so there's different regions, they don't talk to each other. They don't share. They don't, you know, we're Western region. There's a region on the East Coast. I don't know who runs that at all. I don't know what they do. I don't even know their scenario until after they've already run it. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, but at the same time, we're not using our pooled resources to build a better event. So, tr um, you know, our goal was to break down the silos. We publish all our stuff publicly. We have an archive with all our images. We have all um, complete PCAPs. I get emails more from businesses that thank me for publishing PCAPs of that size. Um, but you know, the, the idea is to share everything with competitors and organizers so everyone has the same resources. And you know, prefer the, the, the common vulnerabilities. Make the things that people are going to see. Don't go into the obscure things. You know, if you found like some kind of ROP gadget that nobody's ever used before, or you know, want, you know, some kind of fancy thing that um, you know people are using that nobody else has heard of, that's probably not what you want to put in your competition, unless it's the top of the line. If you're going to be like a DEF CON qualifier, you're going to be the national competition. Maybe that's a good idea, but for everyone else, be realistic. Um, so there's a fine balance there, and when you get down to building. Um, you have to remember that everyone's moving to the cloud in some way, shape, or form, at least for the most part. But that opens up a whole lot of challenges. There's a lot of new attack vectors. One of the biggest ones is Git keys, you know, AWS keys. All those things are really accessible. The problem is cost. As an event, do you have that money to spin up 38 um, S3 buckets that contain, you know, 500 gigs of, you know, random data that you want everyone to pull down? No, you don't because it's expensive. So target your audience and what you want to have in that event. So um, students, make it learning. If it's professionals, make it fun and challenging. If it's a mixed audience, make it something that people enjoy in general. Um, calculate the number of people you're going to have. You need to know the overhead beforehand because as we have learned, if you have only the exact number of people you want and you say, OK, I'm good, especially on compute resources that are shared. Um, you can have unexpected consequences. So calculate the amount of teams, divide them. Um, load balancing is a thing, and you should do that with your, your users and your competitors. Don't rely on them having only one scoring instance because it's not going to work if you have 100 people using it at the same time. The same thing for a infrastructure. If you have 500, 600, 800 VMs running off of the same system, it may be fine when you're developing it, but when you spin them all up, now that infrastructure is loaded. Um, the best example of this is if your work, w at your work, would you have your system running at 95% utilization? Probably not. Um, so the scenario is the main part of any competition. So come up with a good one. Um, this is from layer one this year. Um, they did Star Trek. Um, it was a really cool theming because they had a lot of stuff going beforehand where they were talking about the Enterprise and joining Starfleet and you were going to help Starfleet. It makes it fun because you are curious about what's going to go on. And in the competition, they had things where you had to translate Klingon and other things like that. It's absurd, but that's the type of things that it keeps the game fun because nobody, now you can say I've translated Klingon. Not many people can say they've done that. So it's not always applicable to the real world, but it's something that helps you build something that's almost like the real world. Like the, in their scenario, Star, the Starfleet organization had web services and things like that. Obviously, if I'm prob pretty sure any version of Nginx is not going to be what Starfleet's using in the 23rd century. But you never know. Maybe, they have <laughs> maybe they're still running XP. The big thing, though, is make it fun. 
and make it um, something that organizers are hyped about because then they're going to build the better thing for you. Um, for us, last year we built um, a bunch of different environments. Um, we made um, Merlin storage, um, which advertised great storage capacities because it would all disappear from you. Um, so you never had to worry about your storage space. Then we made um, Jeff, Jeff Bridges Bridges and Ridges, um, which was a landscaping company. And then Triassic Land, which was a theme park that was totally not related to Jurassic Park. Um, and so we made these companies, we made these environments, and we started saying, what would this company have? Why are they in business? And we built them out. We put in you know, things that would be hidden in the competitions. We, had, we seeded flags into you know, Triassic Land where the park could, visitors could get eaten and there was a visitor tally. So if the fences got shut off, the visitor count would go down. Or like Merlin Storage, we put random things on the website um, that would be keyed and we could see if teams were using and browsing and maintaining the website. If they never load it, it never goes away, but also they're not using the website. They're not being part of the environment. Um, so step three is the resources. And as I was saying before, you have to calculate how much your capacity you're going to need because of your teams, and then you're going to have to calculate how much you're going to need for the resources that you have left. And that's a problem because <sighs> how many people here have used AWS and you've forgotten about something? Yeah, it gets expensive. So just imagine that, but for something where you have, you know, instead of your one cluster, for companies, you usually have your team. They're going to do one specific cloud environment. The team is going to say they're going to use Azure. They're going to use AWS. And they're going to, that's going to be their little bubble. Now that bubble's multiplied by 20 or 30. And it's going to need to run for a month at a time. It gets expen expensive. And that doesn't include the development resources. That's something that a lot of people forget about. If you're going to be developing something, it, it doesn't just spring into existence, I should say. You're going to have to have time to develop something because all that time to make the content work and work in that environment and be able to be spun up and spun down, that still costs. And most people are like, well, I just need it for a month. You know, we're gonna, the competition's going to be this weekend. We're going to put everything into testing here, and we're going to shut it down by this date. That's great if your infrastructure is already in place to do that. But whose is? A competition spun up every year. It's not the same thing every year, not the same question. So you have to rebuild it every year. I know myself for CTFs, I've gotten very good at um, importing old challenges and creating a live pool where I can just enable and disable challenges for when I want to run a, just a fun, for fun CTF. The problem is still once you import those challenges, you still have to get everything else operational. You have to make sure that the cha which challenge do you want to enable. And that still takes, you know, for me, a couple hours, but that's still additional cost that wasn't factored into my calculation. So, you know, and then the other thing is if you use physical resources, that's very tricky. Physical resources, they're great, but do you have enough for everyone? Um, one of the things that we run into year after year is, <coughs> Um, for CCDC, we give everyone desktops, well, laptops or desktops, but we give them a physical computer. Well, what happened? You can't just give a team, you know, someone, let's say we had to, you know, have the team crack their own passwords for some reason, and we accidentally ran out of computers. So we gave someone, you know, something with a 1080 in it, and it was just a really beefy computer, and then all the other teams had like netbooks. That wouldn't be fair. And that affects the way the competition works. So making sure you have the same type of equipment is very important. And it's easier now because Raspberry Pis are really great. They're very cheap. They have a lot of RAM. So there are options. But if you're going to use physical resources, it gets challenging. Um, so questions to ask yourself. Um, do you do a hybrid design? Do you do all cloud? Um, do you do a local to cloud design? Um, that was something we actually looked at doing for last year. Um, but we ended up going with um, hosted storage in, um, in OVH instead, which was its own challenge. Um, but the, the idea is how do you design them up and um, what services do you use or do you use multiple? So, and this is where OVH ran into its own problem. Um, Service-wise, they, they had customer service. I don't know how good it was, um, but their systems were good, except for when they weren't and they went bad very fast. Um, we had the OVH downtime challenge. Um, we started a competition, and I think they're laughing because they survived it. Uh, yes, they survived it. Um, but we were running the competition, and I got an email. And 
you know, when you're running an event, you're not really paying attention to email. And the email stated very simply, in 30 minutes we are taking your system down for mandatory maintenance. We will update you as soon as your system will be back up online. And I was like, cool. So I immediately logged into the, their web portal and tried to respond to this ticket saying, no, you can't shut down. We're running an event right now. But at that point, they'd already shut it down. And we didn't know it failed because our monitoring just started trying to do self-recovery. And so the system started going, slowing down and doing red one by one. And by the time we realized they were related, the whole competition had stopped because we had load balanced everything in such a way that if it were to fail, it would take out the whole competition, which is the way you really should do it, honestly. You don't want teams disadvantaged. Like having, if you have a team that can still play when half the teams can't play, that's not fair because they have an advantage. So we had set it up so all the routers for one set of teams was on the other set of hosts. So when it did shut down, everything went down, except for our management stuff. And so the competition went to a halt, but now what do you do? Your hosting provider is taking your system down for maintenance. They don't know when it's going to be up. They're, they don't have a direct contact line, so you have to use web chat. And so it was a bit, this big challenge, and we never planned for that. We've started plan. It's not something you usually plan for. You plan for downtime, you know, before an event, but you don't plan for like unexpected downtime where the the service provider is the one taking it down. So we've we just had to wait it out. We didn't have any choices. So the OVH downtime make when you don't have physical access to your equipment and you don't have any migration plans where you can move it to another cluster, you can use like AWS, you can pick a different reason, re region and spin it up. Even with region spinning up, on average, our automation deployment stuff takes two to three hours to deploy. That you know may seem like a long time, but when you're deploying hundreds of systems, that's not that bad. But for a competition that's in play, that's a lost day. So <coughs> you know, find out what your maintenance windows are you know, find ways to recover. Does that mean you're spinning up an entirely separate backup cluster that's just wasting money in case you need it? It's a question that you have to answer as depending on this, the importance of your event. Um, and then um, the other thing is, as I was saying with automation is, you have this challenge now where when you're building an event, it's easy to automate in the sense that it, it sounds really cool, but does that speed up time does it spe make things faster for you? Um, in many cases, what we've found is no, automation is not helpful in most of the cases because of the way our way competitions are built, it's usually one-offs. You're building either like, you know, a king of the hill system where you just set up a, uh, you know, a WordPress thing that's vulnerable and you're done and you just let them attack it. Or you're building a competition environment where there's a bunch of one-off services. Building those once and cloning them is quick. Oh, okay. Downtime. Um, as I was saying, downtime. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so the, the automation does cause a lot of problems because you're now having to build the environment twice. You have to build it where you test it and then you have to build it where you automate it. So keep that in mind. We're a big fan of automation to help things. So what we've done is we've automated the common vulnerabilities. You know, um, well, you don't know, um, but <laughs> so for example, common vulnerabilities are enabling SSH root login, shared keys, turning um, MySQL to allow all connections, allowing root on MySQL from any connection. All these things are common things that you see every time, but now we've automated it so w those are automatically pushed out at random or installing random packages that we find online. Um, we used to just randomly click, which is a lot of fun, but now it's automated where we just have a pool of files and it just randomly pushes those out and runs them. Um, what they are, anyone's guess. And that makes the computers more dynamic, like our users actually using them. Um, so that had, is a benefit for us. Um, so, and then this is something that I've seen in every single competition ever. You're going to have that one challenge that looks great. It's your coolest challenge and you're never gonna wanna let go of it. Um, and you've planned it that it's tied together where you have five different services dependent on it and it's just gonna be this really cool massive thing and everyone's gonna use it. And then it doesn't work. And you don't know where it doesn't work, but you've only discovered that it doesn't work right before the event. That is not something you can be doing. So um, make a backup plan. Um, for last year, one of the things we implemented was for our automation stuff, um, for our ICS automation stuff, um, each component was removable up to the point where nothing was in the competition from the ICS environment. 
So as things started breaking, we had these um, panels that we were going to use. They didn't work um, right. So we, we put some of them in, but we didn't have everything in. So we, we kept taking out things and making them simpler in the environment to make the competition work because we couldn't get them all working. Another example of this was our mesh network. One of the things we tried to design last year was a, um, a gigantic mesh for each team because they took over four different companies. And so all the companies were meshed together with shared domains, which is great when you have all these components talking to each other. But when the meshes start breaking, it doesn't work. The competition stops. So we had a backup plan where um, the teams actually had a site migration and we moved everything in place. So there's, there's ways around it, but the end, you just have to work with it and get it running. <coughs> so a little preview of the stuff that we've been working on for this year is icons. So for an, a general competition, you're going to have different themed items in the competition, whether it's a website or a blog or some secret thing. For us, <coughs> um, the example I have is you know, like your storage, your you know, data processing, your bank, your e-commerce, your monitoring, all those are common services that you're going to be deploying. Um, for us, w um, what we're s working on is getting all those things in Ansible and using Ansible to deploy them. But you may be asking, well, Ansible's really cool. I can deploy those you know, on systems. But the next step is, how do you deploy them onto your environment? And the common way for that is Terraform. The problem with Terraform, though, is that Terraform requires you to have different configurations for each environment you're about to deploy. It's meant to redeploy a specific type of thing again and again, which is great. You wanted, that's the way you should be doing things. But for a competition like this, where we, ha we may be using VMware, we may be using Zen, we may be using AWS or Azure, all those are different environments and there's no standardized sizes or configurations or anything like that. So our next layer is the deployment component that gets the system up to a point where we can log into it. And that has the abstractions where we can say, you know, you, we need a small system, we need a medium system, we need a large system, and that's abstracted out to whatever that provider has. Which allows us to then say, we need an e-commerce site here, it's going to be doing this type of thing, go here, now deploy it. And then we have our host. So it's, it's using tools that exist, <coughs> but with a little wrapper to make it so we don't have to deal with all those challenges anymore because that is a huge time waste. Um, and so the big thing is, as I was saying, get reporting, get monitoring back so we can see what's going on in the host, get them all up and running and using our tools. Um, it takes about three to four hours to deploy an environment, um, which isn't bad, but you know it can always be better. The main thing though is that it's hands off. Once you've m mastered those systems, it deploys. And it'll always deploy. And that's, that's the type of automation we're going for, is where you can make a competition from one to 100 teams or more, and you don't care how it's going to be, because you know it's going to be the same. And that's generally the purpose of automation. But, to, but competitions don't fit into the usual automation role. So <coughs> again, why not Terraform? It's not a single unified configuration. Um, and our goal is to make automation useful for us, helpful for us, not something that takes us more time. So conclusion, if you're building competition, <coughs> make it open and accessible for all. Keep working to improve your competition and help everyone build skill, not just your competitors, but also your organizers. And then finally, here's our goal plan. Here. <coughs> Sorry. Um, our goal is to continue building out the tooling to build de vulnerable configurations. So that includes um, remote administration tools, legitimate services, bad services, vulnerable services, different versions of services. So we're building ways to f automatically deploy those out. So for example, if we're deploying, let's say, a blog, we can t tangentially install all sorts of other services, including another web server on a different port and all these things, so it just has this big complex list of services, but we're only worrying about one. Um, and then standardizing the way of building services out. Um, making Windows you know, something that can actually be automated. If you go to modern versions of Windows, you can automate using it. Ansible supports it, Chef supports it. You go back to Windows, you know, let's say even 2003, if we're gonna use that, it's really old. 
it literally supports nothing. But if you go newer to like 2008 R2, that's still in existence, and it doesn't support most of the automation we need. If you want to automate it, you have to do quite a few processes to get it upgraded. So our goal is to figure out ways to make that easier so we can get those systems into a way that can be automated and not have to write our own stuff. Because building our own tools does not help anyone. It, it does not make things better for anyone because then you have to maintain another tool. It's going to eventually, someone's going to get tired of maintaining it, and now you have something that's end of life. So future work for us, um, we're incorporating all these new techniques that we're, we talked about. We're building um, more ICS systems because that's where the industry is going. There's a lot of ICS vulnerabilities being discussed. And we've, um, we, you know, we have to have challenges where if you're getting a sponsor, you have to make sure they follow through or you have to find ways to, you know, be more, do it yourself. Because what we ran into this year was we had a sponsor who was helping us and building all the stuff and making all these components for our ICS system that were completely legit. It, had, it was fully functional. But three weeks before competition, they, they had to stop um, sponsoring and stop everything. So what it ends up with is having to scramble to build our own stuff, in addition to still planning to support the competition. So ICS is something that we're, we're working on. One of the things that I've done a lot of is um, um, working with um, open source tools um, or free tools or, I, I don't know where it classifies, but Adafruit IO is a great simulator for ICS. And if you've not thought about um, using IoT um, service providers that are for homebrew for your competitions, you really should because they are amazingly helpful. They allow you to generate content, they allow you to pull content, monitor content, as well as communicate over standard protocols, MQTT or anything else that you want to communicate over. So. Ch those are good. And then the other thing that we want to implement is um, seams. Because companies have seams, competitions don't. Um, teams don't get to use seams. Their, their hair is on fire and we don't provide them with anything. So do we offer them a managed solution or w do we make them install it? Um, but that's, that's how we built our competition. Um, I'd love to open it up if anyone has any questions. Um, but you can follow both of us on Twitter and then our uh, competition website's wrccdc.org. So, if all right, thank you. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you, guys. And I'll be hanging around here for a few minutes in case anyone wants to walk up and ask questions.